Parenting Apart webinar, The Conflict Connection, Understanding What Makes Your Difficult Ex Tick. Now, when a relationship ends, um, it's expected that there's going to be some level of tension um, and conflict. You know, maybe it's because of unresolved hurts, past differences, conflicting perspectives, um, disagreements about how to move forward or parenting. Maybe it's even as simple as parents being in different emotional stages as they're going through this process. All of those different factors can certainly intensify things and can make it a little bit difficult, a little more challenging to move forward in a constructive way. Believe it or not, for the vast majority of parents, after the dust settles, the tension and conflict really does tend to die down. For some, that cooperative relationship, um, it may be an opportunity to forge a cooperative co-parenting relationship. <clears throat> For others, maybe they agree to disagree and engage in what we call parallel parenting. So there's not necessarily a lot of communicating going on, but there's also not a lot of fighting. In actuality, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 to 12 percent of parents um, really get stuck. They are hang on to past issues, get mired down in the anger and bitterness. These are really parents who just can't seem to let go. I mention this to you for a very good reason because I really, as we're talking about dealing with a conflictual ex, when you're in the middle of living it, you know, it can seem like there's no end in sight. But keep in mind that where you are today is not going to be where you are tomorrow. And as hard as it is to imagine things changing with your ex, for most families, things do change over time. For those of you, that are in that 10 to 12 percent or at least feel like you are right now and we're really going to be focusing on ways that you can shield children from unnecessary tension or at best find some way to minimize it and definitely talking about how do you avoid your life being hijacked by divorce drama so let's take a look at where we're headed if you've signed up for this course, I'm guessing there's probably a good reason. You know, dealing with a conflictual ex can sometimes really leave you questioning your sanity. I found in working with parents that understanding you know, the dynamics of what you're dealing with or gaining some insight can really help considerably. You know, this is a very big topic. It's um, often complex and um, can, there's a lot of diversity in every situation. It can be a little bit different from the next. So what I'm really aiming to do is to give you a foundation and hopefully um, some ideas about a good place to start making some important changes. Once you've gained some clarity about the dynamics of conflict, we're going to shift into talking about where you begin. Where do you start? What are those first steps? And I'm going to offer you some practical strategies for moving forward, questions for you to consider regarding your situation. What are some things that you need to be thinking about in um, your relationship and how you deal with your ex? While you don't have any control over how your ex behaves, you can change how you respond to the situations and you can change how you respond to the conflict. So you're definitely not helpless. And we're gonna spend some time discussing some ideas for countering that tension and conflict really all comes down to um, putting energy into the things you can change and pulling back from the things that you can't. Also, when conflict escalates, um, it tends to increase the possibility of more serious issues developing, and those issues are alienation or perhaps a rift in your parenting relationship with your kids. Because a lot of parents are really misinformed, and I'll tell you it's not just parents, a lot of professionals really don't understand the dynamics of alienation. I'm just going to briefly touch on that. Uh, what you should look for and when might you need to be concerned. Um, in my experience, when it comes to dealing with conflict, parents really fall into two categories. And the first one we're going to talk about is the he said, she said type of conflict. And this is a situation where both parents are contributing to fueling the fire. They just keep the fight going. Um, they're very committed to proving their point, to being right, overly focused on things being fair and just. Um, and these are parents that 
Interestingly enough, while they spend a lot of time and energy arguing over their differences, they have a lot in common. And the things that they have in common is that they both very much see themselves as the victim. They um, definitely see the other one as being the problem. They also see themselves as being helpless to create any change whatsoever. This is where they fall into the um, if only type of thinking. If only they would stop doing this, then things would change. If only they wouldn't do this, then things would be better for the kids. It's the parents that just don't seem to realize that they can do anything different or that they can break out of it. So the fighting just continues. These are parents that are also frequent flyers in the court system, um, often using litigation or drawing in other professionals to try and resolve issues and prove their point. These are also um, parents who really have a hard time shielding children. Kids get exposed to lots of fighting, lots of tension, and a lot of adult issues. Now the other type of um, conflict that I want to talk about is that is where one parent really is focused on keeping the conflict alive. In my book I talk about um, there's a saying that tens don't marry twos and what that means is that if you're in a conflictual situation then chances are you're part of the problem. I can tell you from my experience in working with families that there are definitely some situations where the scales tip in one direction more than the other and you may have a situation where there is one parent who is absolutely committed to just maintaining that conflict. Um, they are stuck in the anger and bitterness. It may be that they just have a strong need to control or a controlling personality. They're also very rigid in their views and have a, a strong sense of entitlement. You will frequently hear these types of parents talk about my children and what um, I'm going to do, uh, really wanting, looking at children as if they belong to them and that they are the, the primary parent or have a strong need to be the one who's calling all the shots. Um, I can remember, um, and one of the things that's key about these types of parents is that they feel completely justified in their actions. Um, they're, the things that they do are very intentional. Usually uh, when you say well, you've made this situation worse, they'll own up to it because they feel like the other parent deserves that. I had a dad that I worked with once who was so angry and so bitter about um, mom divorcing him that he would just at every turn look for ways to make things difficult. He was very nasty, um, verbally aggressive, often insulting her. And as far as he was concerned, she really didn't even deserve to breathe the same air as he did because she broke up the family and he was absolutely never going to forgive her. And he felt like that that was completely, his actions were completely justified because of that. So they definitely feel like they're, um, they have been wronged and it needs to be right. Now there's another aspect of parents who, when you have one parent who's more committed to the conflict, and that is the ex that doesn't think they're the problem. Now there's a distinct difference between these two types of parents. The ex that doesn't think they're the problem is a um, a parent who just doesn't get it. And if you were to ask them what kind of parent they are, they would probably say they view themselves as a very good co-parent, that they're very concerned with the kids and that they work very hard to keep the children out of the middle, but you know, you just can't seem to stop um, arguing or fighting. So they really can't see themselves as being part of the problem. What's very different about them from the um, parent that's committed to the conflict is that these parents are nice one day and nasty the next. The only thing that's consistent about them is their inconsistency. They're consistently inconsistent. Um, so it really, if you are on the receiving end of this behavior, it can be very difficult because you really don't know what to expect one day from one day to the next. 
These are also parents who really have a hard time shielding kids. They tend to engage children in discussions about adult issues, put them in the middle with um, things like scheduling, you know, who do you want to be with for your birthday? You really decide. Or if an issue comes up at school, well, you need to talk with your mom about that because that's between you and your mom. Uh, another example may be um, if your ex doesn't tell you about a um, important event in children's lives. Maybe you have a special program at school. They will rationalize it by saying because it's not their responsibility to keep you informed. Your relationship with your child is your responsibility. And besides, if Bobby wanted you there, he would have told you about it. So they really have um, a reason for their action, but they have a very hard time seeing their role in any of it. When you're dealing with a parent like this, you can drive yourself crazy, you know, trying to figure out why, 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 why. Because your ex is constantly transforming from, you know, Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. It can almost be more difficult than dealing with a parent who's consistently conflictual. Because there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, we may make the mistake of really laboring over figuring out, you know, what is it that we can do differently? How can we stop this? Um, and in some ways, by putting a lot of energy into that, we make the situation worse. So what are some ways that you could make the situation worse? We might make the mistake of thinking that if you just keep explaining your perspective from a very logical standpoint, you know, the other parent will eventually come to their senses. One day, they're just going to get it. That's what I call kind of the drip drip theory. We think that if, you know, maybe the hundredth time we tell them it, they'll go, oh, yeah, I get it. Sometimes we think if we're just nicer, more flexible, um, we could turn that corner might have a tendency to replay conversations in our head, dissecting things to try and figure out what it is you're missing. Um, you know, if you just said something differently. Some parents I've worked with just chalk their ex up as psychotic, and so they back way off, they withdraw, and they shut down. And I can tell you that doesn't necessarily make things better for you or your kids. And I just want to be clear, I'm not saying that you shouldn't put energy into trying to make it work. Um, sometimes giving ground is necessary and being flexible and willing to compromise, well, that's an important part of a good co-parenting relationship. However, the gate needs to swing both ways. And with a conflictual ex, it's usually my way or the highway. So if the drama continues to spiral and it doesn't seem to be getting any better, it's time to start thinking about what we can do differently. And before moving into talking about some um, strategies for dealing with a difficult ex. I just want to touch on a concept uh, referred to as negative intimacy. And this is just to give you a little insight into what may be going on with your ex. Now, when you were married and you were in love, you know, we put a lot of energy into that relationship. You know, was, we were passionately loving each other. But when the relationship ends, what happens with negative intimacy is that instead of passionately loving each other, that energy gets redirected into passionately hating each other. Or it, you know, and it can be um, something where it runs both directions. As I talked about the he said, she said battle, you know, both parents are maintaining that connection with one another through the fighting and arguing and waging war. Um, or it may run one direction, you know, with a consistently conflictual parent who's really committed to the conflict or the parent who doesn't think they're part of the problem. What happens is that the connection happens through the conflict, and that is the big payoff for a lot of parents. Sometimes, as a non conflictual parent, this can leave you feeling pretty helpless, and um, you, know, you just don't know what to do about it. So, the first step, and because you feel helpless, the first step sometimes can feel like the hardest because it means evaluating not your ex's behavior but your own. So let's talk about that first step. When you're dealing with a conflictual ex, it's really important to take a look at what's your role. 
how is it that you might be making the situation worse? Now, we touched on some of those things just a few minutes ago, but here's some other ideas. Sometimes one of the things we may do is we base our interactions off of our ex's lead. So when they're being nice, we try to be nice. And, um, you know, then when they change or the tide turns, we feel resentful. We may do things like invite our ex to join us for something or be a little more liberal about scheduling and um, then things change and we end up not talking to each other. And that can be especially confusing for kids because they just can't figure out what's going on. Why is it that one day mom and dad are getting along and the next day they're not? You may also be in a, a constant state of reaction. It's kind of like a knee-jerk reaction. You know, as soon as your ex sends you a nasty email or an angry voicemail, boy, you're right on top of it and you rifle one back. Um, and so you get into this um, dynamic of constantly exchanging emails and responses. And even though you may be responding in a very logical, grounded way, um, it still is giving your ex what they want and keeping that connection alive. Sometimes we may just allow ourselves to be at our ex's beck and call by responding to everything as an emergency. You know, because they're upset, Bobby's made a be on his math test, we've got to talk about this right away. We take the bait and start responding to things as if they are an emergency when in actuality they may not be. So we'll touch on that a little bit more. It's also important to evaluate what is the big payoff for your ex? You know, what is it that they're getting out of this and how can you change the way you are reacting, move more into responding to change the dynamics of the relationship? So what about responding and reacting? Well, I want you to remember that you don't have to swing at every pitch your ex throws your way. Just because you share parenting responsibilities doesn't mean that you have to be available 24-7. Truth be told, aside from emergency situations, you know, really there's very few things that require an immediate response. So when that demanding email comes and it pops into your inbox, resist the impulse to not respond immediately. Give yourself an opportunity to take a step back and ask yourself, is this something I really need to respond to right now? Is this an emergency? Now, if it is something that requires an immediate response, maybe it's time sensitive, then think about it this way. If you had to send your ex a tweet, or you had to send them a Facebook post, and you had to keep it to a 140 characters, how could you stay really focused on the information and yet still respond? So that's one way that you can think about it. You really want to work on keeping the emotions out and just focusing on the issue at hand, which is the kids. Um, also, we want to make sure that we're staying consistent. And this can be a real tough one, because this goes back to that you know, idea of your ex being nice one day and nasty the next. We tend to gauge how we interact by their actions, and that puts us in that that state of reaction instead of thoughtfully responding. So I really encourage what works for you and keep it consistent no matter how your ex is behaving. So if they're nice, you're still communicating and behaving in the same way as when they're not being so nice. The big picture is that you really want to facilitate a relationship that keeps the kids at the forefront and gives them them some consistency in how mom and dad are relating to each other. You know, again, it can be really confusing for kids when things are always changing between mom and dad. They don't know what to expect. It can increase their anxiety. And it also leaves kids really wondering um, if they're to blame. You know, it opens that door up for kids to feel responsible for what's going on for mom and dad. Is it because I asked to play soccer? Is it because, you know, I have a program? Is that what happened? You know, there's a lot of ways that kids may feel like they're the reason that mom and dad aren't getting along because think about it. What are mom and dad arguing about? Well, they're arguing about the kids and that leaves kids um, buying into the idea of all the arguments are about me, then it must be my fault. So we want to protect kids' 
um, from that. And one way we can do that is by staying consistent and really staying focused on the big picture. Also want to really work on, you know, not fixing it. While it's fine to hope that someday things may change between you and your ex, and they may, you need to be realistic about your situation right now. Come to terms with the fact that you can't change the things that your ex says, the way they behave, the choices that they make. So instead of turning yourself inside out, stay focused on what matters most. And that's how you handle the conflict. The way you process issues with your kids and limiting that energy that you give to the divorce drama. Now, um, you know, when you're dealing with this, a lot of times parents will ask um, when issues are going on, when we're not getting along, when my ex is, you know, stirring the pot again, what do I do about the kids? Because certainly they notice. And I think that when it's necessary, if things warrant, um, talking with the kids, certainly process the issue with them. But you need to be really careful that you steer clear of making comments that judge you know, criticize or direct blame at your ex because remember, kids are half mom and half dad. So you want to address issues from your perspective. You want to address them honestly without involving the kids in adult information. So let me give you an example because this can sometimes be um, a little difficult. Let's say that um, dad wouldn't let mom come pick up the boys. And dad says, to the kids that, well, mom can't come get you because she's too busy with her new boyfriend. She doesn't really have time to see you. When mom does get an opportunity to see the kids and they share this information with mom, one of the ways she could respond is by saying, you know, I'm really sorry you had to hear that. That must have hurt your feelings to think that I was choosing somebody else over you. It might have been really confusing. So mom could even go a step further and say something like you know when parents split up they don't always agree on how to work things out and dad and I had a disagreement about when I could pick you up I'm sorry you got caught in the middle I really don't agree with what dad said so by doing that mom is setting a boundary she's letting the kids know that she doesn't agree with dad's perspective but she's also not trying to set the record straight or give them her side of the story that can be confusing for kids as well because they don't know who to believe. So when you draw them into disagreements, they're really caught in the middle of a no-win situation. You want to make sure that you keep the processing really focused on helping them um, understand the problem without placing blame. We also want to stay the course. And again, it can be hard because I tell you, as you refuse to take the bait, you can pretty much expect that your ex is probably going to up the ante and it may get worse before it gets better. Even so, stay committed. Don't, you know, do your best not to impulsively respond to the situations that come up. And I can tell you that over time, as you continue to stand your ground, you're going to find that that conflict is going to become less frequent and less intense. It's also important to realize, and let's see if I can do this without um, in my little tiny screen here, that there's a balancing point when it comes to conflict. You, know, you may have a parent that is, um, you know, wanting to keep that conflict alive. They're creating a difficult situation, and things get really intense, and their their behavior and um, how they're interacting goes here. And you have a choice. You can rise to the occasion and meet them where they're at and um, you know get into the thick of it or you can choose to stay here and eventually there's going to be a balancing point and as you continue to stay down here your ex is going to have to work their way back down. There, there is definitely um, a middle range so keep that in mind that you want to keep your eye on the prize and um, not not get sucked in to you know those types of situations it is without a doubt you know very mentally and emotionally draining but you want to keep in mind that it's about the long game you're playing the long game not the short haul in order to do that you got to make sure that you've got a good support system so you know in order to go the distance 
you may need to get some outside support. Find a good life coach, think about a counselor, somebody that can help you gain some clarity and kind of get some emotional distance from some of the things that are going on. When you do that, make sure that you're working with somebody who understands the dynamics, who has some experience in dealing with conflictual situations and divorce so that you're getting the right kind of help. In truth, there really are no easy answers. Some of it is going to be trial and error. And so you may try something, it doesn't work so well, and so you try something else. But don't give up hope. Stay committed because it will really pay big dividends for your kids down the road. So let's just wrap up. Um, again, we're going to just hit the tip of the iceberg with some of these, but I want to give you some additional tips and also just touch on the issue of parent alienation and what kind of things you need to look for. When things get tough, and if you are dealing with a lot of tension and conflict from your ex, I really would encourage you to think about documenting your interactions. Now, this isn't about, you know, keeping a journal or a diary of all the ways your ex has done you wrong or writing a mini novel about um, everything that happened blow by blow. I really want you to look at it as like you're someone reporting the news. You just want to stick to the facts, you know, on this date, kids were picked up, had this kind of interaction, or on this date we um, spoke via email and decided that the pickup time would be this. Uh, on this date, you know, other parent didn't respect change in schedule, wasn't there for pickup. Those are the kind of things that you want to put in there. Now there's a couple of different benefits to documenting. One of them is it gives you the opportunity to notice patterns when you go back and look over some of the interactions because when you're dealing with a conflictual ex it can get kind of crazy It'd be a little difficult to keep track of what you agreed when and since the rules are always changing if you have something to look back at and refer to that can help you keep it straight and track it a little easier but you may start noticing things you know one time you may have tried something it worked really well it might be something you want to revisit or you want to incorporate into how you're dealing with your ex um, also if a situation escalates and sometimes that does happen and you may be forced into a legal situation that documentation can be very helpful and give you something to refer back to something definitely to think about so what is parent alienation? I'm going to tell you that this is a hotbed of controversial e controversy, even in professional circles with lawyers, mediators, family court judges, mental health professionals. You know, there's a, a lot of different opinions about what parent alienation is and what it isn't. I can tell you that from my experience in working with parents who are dealing with parent alienation, it really is a dynamic that involves one parent committing themselves to destroying um, the healthy and loving relationship that exists between a parent and the other child. It's very similar to brainwashing in that it's all about distorting reality and putting pressure on a child to really view one parent as all good and one parent as all bad. You know, to sum it up, you're either for me or against me. That's the kind of thinking that takes place for a parent that is engaging in alienating behavior. Now, it's not a black or white issue, and there's a lot of areas of gray. Parent alienation is, is very complicated, and the dynamics tend to be very intricate um, and diverse. You know, every situation can be a little bit unique. It can range from very subtle to very extreme. And if you want more information, there are a lot of really excellent resources out there that can um, certainly help you out with that. And when you're dealing with parent alienation, there are some warning signs, some things that you should look for. I'll tell you that one of the big pitfalls is that more often than not, parents don't recognize or realize what's happening until it's too late. And when they begin to realize that something's not okay and things are changing and they're becoming concerned, um, they don't always find a lot of help in the court system or from mental health professionals because they tend to be very slow to respond. Unfortunately, alienating parents can have the ability more often than not to really use the court system to their advantage by making accusations um, or uh, uh, manipulating the court system into creating obstacles for parents and children to spend time together. 
So if you do get to a point where you need to take this into the family court or you need to address certain issues legally, make sure that you have a family law attorney who is familiar with parent alienation and really understands the dynamics because that can make a very big difference in how you handle the case. What are some things you need to look for? Well, if you have um, a child that is refusing contact, um, and I'm not just talking about one weekend, but consistently refusing contact, you've had a formally loving relationship with your child, and now you're hearing things like, I hate you, I can't trust you, it's all your fault, why can't you just leave us alone? Those are things you really need to pay attention to. Kids that are uh, being pressured to reject a parent also typically mimic accusations of the alienating parent so you will hear them express opinions or ideas or talk about things that clearly have been told to them by the other parent however what's different about this is children really take those ideas and those feelings on board as their own and they're adamant that this is not something the other parent has told them that this is the way they're thinking and feeling in very severe cases, when kids um, succumb to the pressure of alienation, they will uh, typically display disrespect. They um, may even have contempt for a parent and absolutely no guilt or remorse. I remember working with a mom once who was alienated from her 13-year-old son and um, this son was so committed to this hate campaign that he was actually working with dad to try and convince his younger brothers to hate mom too and that they should um, live with dad and not with mom so he was actually joining in and trying to alienate his brothers now that is a very severe case um, and you know that is not your run-of-the-mill case but you just want to kind of keep tabs Along with that, be careful though, because you don't want to jump to conclusions. Um, you know, just because a child is refusing to spend time with you or saying that they don't want to spend a weekend with you, don't make the mistake of jumping to the conclusion and thinking that the other parent is alienating your child. Sometimes kids have very valid reasons for not wanting to spend time together, so you're looking for um, consistency. You know, one example is when kids move into the teenage years. You know, a very structured schedule may not work well for them, and sometimes they'll balk at having to come spend the weekend, and they'll ask for you know different arrangements to be made. That's more normal developmental issues where parents really need to be flexible. That's not something that's alienation. Another hallmark of this is that when kids um, are struggling with alienation or being pressured by an alienating parent, they really um, disengage from all contact. So if you're still having contact with your kid but there's some resistance, you might want to evaluate the situation and see if there are other factors that might be affecting that. If you are seeing some things that are concerning you and um, you're not so sure whether um, parent is participating in alienation or are you interested in nipping that in the bud and heading it off, you absolutely need to get educated and definitely seek out professional support. You know, again, alienation is very complicated and it is a long road to hoe when um, that dynamic creeps in. So you want to make sure that you've got a trained professional who can help you um, and you want to make sure that you really have a good understanding. Now, in my book, Parenting Apart, I dedicated an entire chapter to dealing with a conflictual ex and also a chapter on parent alienation. So if you're wanting some basic information, that might be a good place to start. Also, in the back of the book, there's a list of recommended resources, and I have um, categorized those by topic, and so there's a whole section on parent alienation and um, hostile aggressive parenting, and so there's some resources that you might want to check out. Down at the bottom of this list, I have highlighted in red, you need to stay involved and continue contact. Now, this is another area where we can get ourselves into trouble because parents make the mistake of thinking, if I just give my kids some space, they'll come back to me. They'll realize what's going on, they'll see the truth, and things will be okay again. The problem is, is that kids don't ever get to that place because what happens is 
when kids are left to try and figure things out on their own and you pull back, um, they don't have an alternate perception of reality to balance out what they're getting from the alienating parent. So it's really important, even if it means compromising, even if it means being flexible, do what you can to stay involved with your kids, make it positive time. Um, you want to put in a lot of deposits into that relationship, as many as you can, to offset um, what they're hearing with the other parent. So we've kind of winding down and I'd like to open up the call for any questions you might have about some of the things that we've talked or maybe you just want some specific feedback about a circumstance that you're dealing with. So Catherine, if you have any questions, if you would just um, post them out for me and be happy to answer them. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, I really don't believe I'm the problem. Am I part of the problem? <laughs> Well, that's a really good question. I, I think that I think you need to take a careful look, and a lot of it has to do with intention. Um, I think parents can have a good gauge. You know, sometimes one of the ways that you can step back and examine whether um, your reaction is on target or not is by talking with another person, getting some feedback from someone else who you feel like can offer you an objective perspective. Maybe that's a close trusted friend or um, maybe it's a professional. You know, get some feedback to kind of weigh that out if you're not so sure. Uh, another way of looking at it is to ask yourself, if I was engaging in this situation with anyone else, how would I respond? What if it was a colleague at work that I was having a disagreement with? How would I respond? You know, a lot of times if parents think about their relationship as a business partnership and you both have a lifetime investment in raising happy and secure kids, um, that can shift things and you can use a lot of those same skills that you would use with a colleague or if you had to work with somebody you didn't like very much. You can use those same skills in negotiating and communicating with your ex. So, um, any other questions that you have? Okay, so what do I do when um, my ex says mean things that are not true about me? Shouldn't I defend myself? Well, that absolutely is an excellent question, and it's one that parents struggle with quite a bit. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when kids are given information by a parent or they hear bad things about a parent, maybe things that aren't true, we're not necessarily doing our kids any favors by trying to set the story straight or um, give them our side of things. What happens is, so let's, let's, let me just give you an example and maybe this will make it a little bit easier. Let's say that Johnny is having a chat um, with Dad and Dad says, you know, um, it tells Johnny some information about mom and so what does Johnny do with that information? Well he goes to mom and he says, hey mom, you know, dad said that um, really the divorce is all your fault. You know, you um, flirted with everything on the block that had a pulse and your tops are too tight and your skirts are too short and really, you know, it was all your fault. Well let's say that there's not a grain of truth in anything that dad has told Johnny mom has choice to make you know she can set the record straight and tell you know dish something out on dad and tell Johnny her side of the story or she could say something different she might say something like you know again I'm really sorry you had to hear that you know when a divorce happens there's usually a lot of different reasons that things don't work out between mom or dad and sometimes um, parents get very angry about the marriage not working and one of the ways they may deal with those angry feelings is to say something mean or hurtful to the other parent and what I want you to know is that um, if mom and dad are having problems with each other that doesn't mean you have to have problems with mom or dad um, what's going on between us is an adult issue and I want you to be able to love your parents, both of your parents, as much as you want. So mom has an opportunity. She can also go a step further and ask Johnny, how do you feel about what dad said? What do you think about that? And, um, you know, give Johnny an opportunity to kind of process his feelings on the matter. 
but there are ways you want to really steer clear again of judging, criticizing, or laying blame. Often sharing our side of the truth, again, draws kids into the middle because they're caught trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong. So when you talk about um, healthy boundaries, okay, can I give an example? Um, healthy boundaries would involve uh, really communicating with each other in a respectful way. Um, also, not becoming your ex's doormat, so you don't want to always roll over uh, just for the sake of keeping the peace. It's okay to set some limits around your relationship. Also, an another way of maintaining healthy boundaries is um, being consistent in how you interact with your ex. Yeah. So it's not about how your ex is behaving. It's really about you making a choice of what kind of parent you're going to be and how you're going to respond to the conflict. It's making that commitment to take a higher road. That would be an example of setting a healthy boundary. So if you have an ex that's being really nasty, you don't waver in how you respond. Kids see you behaving in the same way. When you have an opportunity to get angry, you choose to handle it um, with integrity. Any additional comments or questions that anyone might have? Well, I just want to leave you with a final closing thought um, before we call it a night. You know, while you may not be able to make it better, it's really important to realize that at any given time, you certainly have the ability to make things much worse. And so my advice to you is do what you can to not make it work. And clearly there are a lot of things about divorce that we can't fix or change for our children um, and we may not be able to make them better but we can do things that can lessen some of the confusion the anxiety and the tension that they experience as they're making this very big change in their lives I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule especially in the evening after you've gone through the day got kids tucked in, um, you know, getting into the late hours. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate an opportunity to share this information with you. And if you felt like that this um, webinar was beneficial, I would be both honored and delighted if you would kind of spread the word and share this information with other parents you might know that would benefit. Also, when um, we close out, they'll take you to a survey. And if you have any comments, something that you really liked about the program this evening or ways that we could improve it for future presentations, I would absolutely love to hear your comments. So thanks very much, and 